So I've always wanted a Famicom system, maybe because the NES, I have such fond memories of the NES, and I wanted to see where it all began, I guess, where it all started. And, and that was with the Famicom. Now, we had the NES, obviously, because the Famicom worked in Japan, and Nintendo saw an opportunity in the U.S., but after the crash with video games and everything, and the Atari, and then television, and all the other stuff that happened then, it was a bit of a risk. But this is the original NES, I, I guess you would say. It released in 1983 in Japan, and obviously the rest is history with it working in the U.S. as a different shape, model, and look. We'll talk a bit about that as we open this guy up, but I really wanted to get one. I was at Too Many Games, I saw this box, it has some like cellophane on it and seal. I think it was just kind of resealed, it's not an actual like sealed one. Don't worry for the people out there who are about to freak out when I open it. It's already kind of open on top anyway because it was basically just resealed. But I want to take the time to open this guy up, uh, the System 1 box, and we'll open it up as well and talk a little bit about the Famicom because the Famicom really is an amazing piece of video game history. So we're, I guess we'll just go ahead and open the resealing that took place here, I guess. Uh, and then we'll kind of unbox it from there. Styrofoam on the back, by the way. That, that's how it was back then. I mean, this is, like I said, the early 80s. This is how it was. You got styrofoam and all that stuff, and it would break apart, and it'd get everywhere. I do like just how colorful the box is. I mean, yeah, it's silver, but it has, like, this the red, of course, across there. It really pops off. Kind of the silver and the red, and then some of the white on the family computer just pops off of here. It, it is a really nice effect. Uh, but this is what they this is what they put on the shelves in, in Japan to see if they can make it work, and they did. The family computer from Nintendo, of course, we call it the Famicom. On the side here, kind of has a the, the Famicom with all the colors of the different cartridges shown. I mean, this is again Nintendo uh, having a very colorful lineup. We're talking about like the Switch Lite and all this stuff now. Of course, all the different colors of like the 2DS and the 3DS and everything. They've been doing that for for a while now. Uh, more just family computer writing on the side there, I believe on the top, same deal. And then on the side, same deal. So it's pretty much the same look all the way around. And then the back is just all styrofoam. There we are. So I hadn't opened this yet. Obviously it still had some sealing around it. I had thought about something after I bought it. How am I gonna plug it in? I, I still have to figure that out because of course it is RF. Like, there's no AV or anything on it. That's one thing I liked about the NES, by the way, when it came out, the front loader, it did have yellow and red on the side, so you could technically plug it in and plug it in, I guess, technically to a converter or something a bit easier than what you would do with something like uh, the RF. Now, everything in here looks, ex like, it looks stock. I mean, it has the Nintendo branded RF. It has the Nintendo AC adapter here. Look at that guy. There we go, Nintendo AC. That's, that's pretty funny. Uh, 10 volt, 850 milliamp. So this thing doesn't need a lot to work. It, it, it is powered on, uh, obviously not a, not a ton of power. I believe it uses four watts. So pretty good in terms of power. Let's lift this guy out here. And look at this, this is pretty cool. This actually has, appears to be the manual with it. I'm actually gonna move this guy to the side here. I don't need that anymore. But it does have the manual. And this is pretty funny. Uh, just kind of looking through this, I can't read uh, any Japanese writing or anything, so I'm not really sure what a lot of this says. Although they have pictures for everything, how to hook it up. This is this is pretty cool. So, oh, remember this where you had to actually screw it in to the back if you had that kind of TV? But kind of neat to see the actual manual there, so that's pretty fun. Uh, the system itself, not as yellowed. I was kind of concerned that it would be a bit more yellowed, but it's not too bad, actually. It's, uh, it looks looks to be in pretty good shape overall. Still has kind of the stickers on the front here. Looks like it's starting to wear a little bit around it, but not too bad. Uh, has the full eject here. Uh, I did get a game from them just to test with, but I realized, again, I don't have any way to uh, to plug it in currently, because I believe it's just RF on the back here. So it has RF, power, game, TV, and then of course your channel change. So you can switch between channel two and three, uh, but nothing when it comes to AV on the back. So you'd have to get a way to convert it. And I'll look into that. There might even be kits, to be honest, if I want to figure out how to make this go to AV, or, or I know there's even HDMI kits being created now. So there are a lot of different modifications you can do with it. Uh, and that's pretty fun. I'll probably look into some of those. I have the really, I mean, the really hard sounding, like the, like the, I mean, you're really turning that thing on when you crush it. Resets a bit softer. 
But I mean, you know you're turning this thing on when you hit it like that. They had all kinds of stuff for this. I mean, they had uh, what the they had a modem that you could actually sign in and gamble with this thing. They had a full disc unit. It was pretty neat at the time. They really did a lot with this, and that's why they had it kind of the family computer. Now, of course when they moved it over to the US, they didn't want it to be seen as necessarily a video game system because those still weren't held in the best regards in the US at the time with the Atari. So they changed it up. They wanted it to look apparently more like a VCR and that's why they went with that front loading system. And that's actually what has made NES systems kind of finicky now. Whereas this had a full top loader, we of course, we're dealing with a front loading uh, kind of setup and that's why we have the blinking red light now and having to replace the 72 pin connector and why people modify the top loader that eventually came over. It's because they tried their best to change the image of what this is in Japan and make it look more like, I guess, an entertainment device in, in the US. They even tried to make it look a bit more like a toy with Rob, but either way, it all worked out and eventually we got a top loader. Just for some reason, Nintendo did what Nintendo does and they took the, the AV ports off the side. Now, the one thing I definitely liked that they made the change for was that the controllers would actually plug in. So you could buy an extra controller. If your controller was damaged, it wasn't essentially wired into the point where it can't be removed. It was an odd thing, I guess, at the time for the, uh, the Famicom to do that. But this is of course also where we had the D-pad popularized and yes, it is still a really, really good D-pad. I don't really like that the wire comes out of the side here because it seems to kind of get in the way, I guess, of how we normally hold our controllers now. You can kind of do this thing where obviously you split your fingers around it like that, but you'd always know it seems that that's there. Probably, no, see that one's the same as well. You definitely know that that cable's there. I don't really know why it comes out. It doesn't come out the front, maybe because they want it so that it, it essentially pushes out of the back when you put it away. That's all I can imagine, but the cables aren't even that long anyway. So you're you're sitting pretty close to this guy when you're playing. It was you are you are not sitting far away. So uh, odd to have that, but for some reason they opted for it. The buttons, A, B, uh, the D-pad, everything feels good. You have volume. You also have a microphone here, which is kind of neat. That's a cool idea. Something else that I guess didn't make the cut when they moved it over. But either way, uh, definitely a, a first, uh, definitely a controller from the 80s. One of the first, obviously, from Nintendo. But man, the D-pad will never get old on these. I also like the manual, like the, the manual flap here where you have to be mindful and close it up when you're done. Obviously, we had spring-loaded ones with the Super Nintendo and the Genesis and everything. Uh, but this was really funny. That you have to just remember you got to close it up when you're all done now moving over to the bottom is where we can actually start taking it apart and they used phillips head screws which is good uh because if you remember as they went on with nintendo they eventually had like their game bit driver which is really annoying to deal with where you have to use this weird like looking uh driver to open up all kinds of stuff with that thing i mean it was like the super nintendo needed it the n64 needed it this is fortunately before that time it seems and we just stuck with uh phillips heads even the nes used a phillip head uh, driver. So fortunately we weren't to that point yet. So just a couple of screws looks like six on the bottom here and the whole bottom I assume should lift out. Okay. So we got our six screws in there. Definitely felt like they've been in there for a while since you had to kind of break them loose a bit and the bottom just comes off. Just a solid piece of plastic here. Looks like we have the tracks. I assume that's for like the disc unit that fits in on the bottom. And here is our system. The, the lead is that, or sorry, the solder is actually very shiny, which I believe at the time we still weren't with uh, standards that we have now where you have to have lead free solder. So there's definitely a bunch of lead in this solder, but it's very shiny, which is good. Uh, the board itself looks solid. Like it looks really nice. Here's the funny thing. Uh, I'm noticing this right now. The controllers that are wired in, of course, technically are just plugged in inside in the motherboard here. So this, the controllers actually will unplug, which is kind of funny because I guess there were, uh, so at the time there was probably a repair service where if your controllers broke, I bet you, you could send it away. And I'm looking at this and I'm realizing that they probably just took the system in, charged you some money and unplugged the controller, plugged it in and sent it off. Uh, something that, that that's kind of, that's kind of a funny idea there, but yeah, that seems to be the deal. So technically if you can get a hold of new controllers and yours break, it is just a, 
you just plug it in. You just unplug, plug a new one in, run the uh, cables around so they fit in, and you're good to go. We only have another six screws that were around the edges to get the board free. What's kind of annoying is it seems that they just went ahead and wired in, uh, what is that, the power switch it looks like. That's just straight up wired in, so that wasn't a plug, but the controllers are, which is, which is a little weird. The cartridge slot itself is completely soldered in right here. And they also had some screws go through to really hold it and solidify it. It is a top loader and I do kind of wish the original system that came over to the US had been a top loader because of course you don't have those issues where it won't read the game correctly sometimes. It's very weird and finicky, you gotta play around with it a lot. This made it so much better. So yes, we eventually got a top loader, but it was missing the AV and that was a little annoying. And those are also pretty hard to find as opposed to the NES, which is pretty easy to actually get a hold of but like working, yeah, it's, it's another story, I guess. Now, the one thing I like about these older systems from like the 80s is, is that it's very easy to see everything. Everything's easily labeled. It's all actually pretty easy to remove. It's not like how it is now with like ball grid arrays or BGA chips or anything like that. Uh, but you have a PPU, you have a CPU. It's a Rico 28038-bit 1.79 megahertz, and that's right there. And then we have our PPU. There's also a couple of different devices divided pieces of RAM. You have two kilobytes of onboard RAM. Then you also have two kilobytes of video RAM. I just like that everything is seriously like right here. And again, if, if there was a repair service, which I assume there was, actually removing these chips with leaded solder and then dropping new ones into the board was probably a super easy repair process. I actually kind of wish I was repairing systems back then because this would have been much less of a headache. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna do it here for the Famicom system from Nintendo, released in 1983. It's a system I've been looking to get for a while now, and I finally found it at Too Many Games. You might be wondering, well, John, you've been looking for this forever, and the first thing you do is open it up, and to those people I say, yeah, you must be new here. And, and if you are, you should probably subscribe below if you like taking a look inside of this system and check out some of the other tech waves we've done. I did a Panasonic Q recently. And uh, make sure you guys like the video if you enjoyed this look at the Famicom, just like it if not. And guys, I got some really cool stuff coming up as well. Some other systems I picked up at Too Many Games. This wasn't the only one that kind of blew the budget a bit there. There were some other fun ones. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>